In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When the Lord came to earth, there was a prevailing notion that affected everyone, that it was evil who had all the power, and that in the face of evil, goodness was impotent, lifeless, without strength, losing the battle between good and evil. That is the world in which our Lord entered into. And because of that notion, remember that very curious incident that took place in the Gospel after Jesus performed a miracle. And the Pharisees said, well, no, he performed that miracle through the prince of demons. Now, they weren't accusing the Lord of being demonic, but they were saying, where else would he get that power but from the evil one? That's how twisted things were. So our Lord enters into the world with this, and he brings good news. He brings the news that, no, this false notion of evil having the upper hand and the final word is false, wholly false, because it is the goodness that the Lord brings that has the power and has the strength. But see, the evil one uses fear. That is his basic weapon to basically derail us from this belief in God's goodness and God's power and his ability to transform even the worst of things into good. That is what the Lord came for, and that is what he does for us. So we have the incident today in the Gospel about the very desperate father who has been worried sick over his son for years since he was a child because of the torment that the son was experiencing. And like any parent, the torment of a child torments the parent. And in this, there's a desperation. And he hears that Jesus is in town. And so as part of the crowd, he enters the crowd, and says to Jesus, uh, talks to Jesus about his son. And he says, if you can do something, uh, please do something about this. And the Lord responds, if I can do something? And he calls the person to a belief, a trust, that yes, I can do this. But perhaps like many of us, we hear the good news and, I say, and we say to the Lord, Lord, yes, I believe, I believe, but help my unbelief. There's always something in the background that, that kind of weaves and creates a bit of a doubt. We hear the good news, we hear about the Lord's triumph, yeah, but does it really apply to this situation? And he says, the Lord says, if you believe, you can, make, you can tell this mountain to move from here to there. What is this mountain that Jesus is talking about? The mountain is our earthly cares. That's the mountain. And so our Lord is calling us to trust in this. And how does he do this? After the Lord casts out the demon out of the boy, and the boy is now restored, the apostles approach Jesus afterwards and says, why couldn't we do this? And it's kind of interesting because in the beginning of their ministry, they were doing this. But somehow along the line, something changed in them. 
Could have been pride. I don't know what was going on. But somehow they kind of lost the power that the Lord gave them. Very curious. And the Lord says to them, well, the only way to do this, the only way to release anybody from torment, from evil spirit or whatever, is through prayer and fasting. Now, prayer and fasting, it's not, the Lord is not talking about a technique. You know, if you do this certain amount of prayers, and if you fast a certain amount of days, uh, you're going to get a result. It doesn't work that way, right? Prayer and fasting is a state of mind. It's an attitude. That is what the Lord is talking about in terms of prayer and fasting. It's an attitude of trust in the Lord. It's an attitude that without the Lord, I can do nothing. That's liberating for us because then we don't have to be God, right? We don't have to act like God, like it's all up to us. So it's that attitude of trust, of surrender to the Lord, of whatever is burdening us, whatever that we are praying for or wanting to change. Our Lord says this attitude of prayer and fasting. And what is that? You know, prayer is this putting ourselves into the Lord's hands, being present to the presence, allowing the Lord to look at us as we look at the Lord, and being ourselves totally in prayer with all of our heart, sometimes pouring things out, sometimes shaking our fist at the Lord. Whatever it is, our prayer is genuine when we are our real selves in prayer. And we go before the Lord just as we are. And we have prayers. Yes, we do. We have in our prayer book, we have you know, the hours. We have all these that help aid us sometimes in finding words that maybe we can't come up with ourselves, and that helps us. But the words are only a tool to enable us to grow in deeper relationship with the Lord, true relationship with the Lord, you know, it is Lord and me. We are together. And we are spending this time together, and I am being myself with the Lord and bringing my life to the Lord and allowing, and then having an, an attitude of receptivity to receive all that the Lord wants to give me in that prayer. And then there's fasting, which is basically getting rid of the things that are getting in the way of my relationship with the Lord. So some of us cannot fast specifically with food. So then we're, we're called to fast from other things. Fast from anger. Fast from whatever, a, a grudge, or whatever is getting in the way of my relationship with the Lord. And fasting is just a way to come before the Lord, just as we are, at times very weak, feeling very powerless to be able to do anything, and we say, Lord, I am creating a space for you, for you to enter. And fasting creates that space. Because otherwise, sometimes we get so busy, you know, we're trying to get, this, get all these things done, that sometimes, all of a sudden, it's up to us again. It's all up to me. And so fasting is a reminder that, no, there is this wonderful synergy we do our part, and God completes the rest. That's the promise that he gives. And fasting reminds us of that. And so, in this fasting and prayer, the Lord is able to do what he wants to do for us, and also for those who we care about. We also are a church, and that is where we gain our power, in a sense, because we have the church not only as a, a place where we gather, but also the church as a place of encountering Lord in a very specific, clear way of heaven, heaven meeting earth and earth meeting heaven. And throughout our week, when sometimes it seems like heaven is way out there, when we come to church, 
we have this intentional realization that I am entering a place where heaven meets earth and earth meets heaven. And that's where the power is. And that's where the victory is. You know, in the sacraments, in the word of God, in our fellowship with one another, as we support one another, as we try as best we can with all of our heart, mind, and soul to live the gospel life and to know that we're all in this together and that the Lord is with us and we have this cloud of witnesses around us in our icons that remind us of men and women who have gone before us. So they're with us. We have the angels with us. We're very much present here. And so we are fortified and given, giving strength. And what's the strength? The strength is that we share in the victory. You know, we, we may see the news and going, ay, 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 ay. You know, evil's taken over again. We're, you know, we're goners. We're doomed. But when we come here, we're reminded that's bogus. It ain't, it's not true that we share the victory. We experience the cross, yes, but we share the cross of healing, of love, and of victory. That's the cross. And so, yes, we are people of the cross, but we also know that the resurrection did not happen after the cross. The resurrection is in the cross, right? It's there already. And we share that victory. So I'd like to quote, finally, from Psalm 83, uh, which, is, uh, which we pray in the ninth hour in our office. And uh, it, it goes like this. And just a reminder, you know, this is what this place is. How beloved are your dwellings, O Lord of powers. My soul longs and faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoiced in the living God. For the sparrow has found itself a house, and the dove a nest for herself where she may place her nestlings. Well, for our case, a duck. <laughs> so as we gather here together, we rejoice that we have entered into this dwelling place of the Lord, that he has invited us personally by name to be here, together. And so let us rejoice and be glad and let us continue to have an attitude as we continue our Lenten journey into Pascha, an attitude of surrender to the Lord, surrendering ourselves to the Lord. Here I am, Lord. Do with me as you will, because the Lord is giving us a choice. We can either follow the old boy who is nothing and lost the battle, leads us nowhere, or we can follow the Lord Jesus who gives us life to the full. And that is the promise that the Lord gives us and will continue to give us always. So let us praise the Lord and give finally gratitude to the Lord of all that he does for us. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind always, now and ever, and on to the ages of ages.